The time has come to start the sixth issue of Nintendo Power. We've got some rare titles, both literally and figuratively, in this issue. Our cover of this issue is Battle Toads and Double Dragon. The art is drawn art, and it's okay, but it's not exactly memorable. In the letters column, there isn't much of a theme this issue. We do have a couple letters related to parents who game with their kids. First game in the SNES session this issue is Bob, a run-and-gun action platformer. We have information on the power-ups and maps of each of the first six stages. Bob is a very deliberate platformer. Movements are have some very real, real weight to them. The controls are simple, but they work well for this type of game. The world has a real sense of character to it, and Bob, with his semi-insectoid head and his quips at the start of each level, and with each death for that matter, has some very real flair to him. Interestingly, this game uses the same engine as Wayne's World, but as a game, it executes on its gameplay concepts and world design so much better than the other title did. So that's definitely a point in its favor over the movie-licensed game. Next up is Tasmania. Going from this article, this is basically a mix of a collectathon platformer and a behind-the-back racer, like Rad Racer. So, here's how Tasmania works. You run through a set course with a behind-the-back perspective, like a rad racer. You have a goal to eat a number of kiwis, that's the small flightless bird, not New Zealanders. If you don't reach that goal before the end of the course, the course loops and you keep going through it until you get all the kiwis or you run out of time, whichever comes first. While doing this, you have to avoid obstacles like vehicles, road signs, or other similar things. Where things fall apart is that the game itself loops itself. By the end of each act, you come back to the variant of the first level, now with more obstacles, and with the added threat in terms of Taz's mother, who will catch him and embarrass him to death if you are not careful. Taz's mother catching him is an instant game over, and you have a limited number of continues, and you have no feedback as to where her location is, and her location is not tied to the time limit. It makes the game rather frustrating, which could be alleviated with the limited continues, but that is not the case with this game. Next, we have a rundown of two different collections of casino games, Vegas Stakes and Caesar's Palace. Vegas Stakes is your standard casino game with something of a progression. You have several different casinos you can go to, all with more or less the same handful of casino games, but with different minimum and maximum bets, with your ultimate goal to being to win $10 million. It's a decent setup and something that gives you a better option than your standard PCE LCD casino game collection. Additionally, this game's version of poker has you actually playing against AI-controlled people, instead of being just a variant of video poker. It's still a casino game collection, but it's a better collection than most. Now, Super Caesar's Palace, on the other hand, is a little more bog standard. All of the casino games are single-player games, and there's no real goal aside from play until you're done. Further, the interface has some real issues. You have to walk through the casino to choose what game you want to play. And while some games have signs above them telling you what they are, others do not. Additionally, you place bets one chip at a time, as opposed to just selecting the appropriate cash value and the game automatically putting the correct amount of money on the table. Next, we have one of our feature articles. In 1993, marketing for consoles had started leaning more heavily on the hardware. And this article, Power U, gets into that. It calls out blast processing as a gimmick, which I'd call legit. While dismissing the improved audio capacity as CD -ROM, of CD-ROM gaming as not adding to the experience, which I would disagree with. Of particular note in the article is the discussion of bottlenecks in system performance, with Nintendo saying that their faster memory access time makes up for their slower CPU clock speed. 
I wouldn't exactly agree with that. You still have a different bottleneck in the process. It's just further up at the CPU as opposed to the memory of the system. Now we're coming into our featured series of games with all the new Battletoads titles coming out. First up is Battletoads and Battle Maniacs for the Super Nintendo. Going by the premise, Zitz and an ally of the Toads, Michiko, have been kidnapped by the Dark Queen. Going from the level maps in this article, this setup is pretty much the same as the first Battletoads title. This game is not great. Your momentum is weird. I realize it's been a while since I played the first Battletoads game, but still. The momentum feels weird, with the character picking up speed when you hold down the D-pad, while also dashing if you double tap to the left or right. This in turn causes some problems with precise maneuvering when it comes to avoiding some obstacles. Additionally, the game ignores some innovations that other brawlers have picked up since the first Battletoads game, like letting your strikes hit multiple opponents at once if they're really close together, which in turn lets you avoid cheap hits. Hell, the whole thing with uh, Final Fight is it's based around, mechanically, maneuvering your opponents so they're close together so that you can hit multiple opponents at once. Further, some opponents just take too many punches to code down, which makes the game tedious and also again leads to cheap hits when you have multiple opponents of the same more dangerous or at least more robust variety on screen at the same time. It's enough of an issue where continues take you to mid-level checkpoints rather than to the beginning of the level. While I certainly appreciate this, it does make the game feel overlong. Next is Battletoads in Ragnarok's World, which also looks like a remake of the first game, this time for the Game Boy. Well, the levels are the same as the first game, with a few graphical adjustments to reflect the limitations of the Game Boy hardware. To the game's credit, it also almost nails the camera perspective you need to give the sprites of the characters sufficient distinctiveness while also making them sized appropriately where you can participate and or anticipate where you need to move. Also, the Turbo Tunnel music sounds really good on the Game Boy. Now, I say almost with the camera perspective because there are a few places, especially in the rope descent stage, where enemies are just a little too far off screen to easily hit, and there are some cheap hits on the first boss fight that are also brought on by this as well. Further, the game has the same slippery acceleration problem that the Super Nintendo version had, which leads me to suspect this is something distinctive to the Battletoads series. Finally, we have Battletoads and Double Dragon for the NES. Going from the article, it looks like we, it plays like the Battletoads series, but it has Billy and Jimmy from Double Dragon in it. Now, I'll say this for Battletoads and Double Dragon. It has some of the of the best graphics on the NES. There is some really good scaling and scrolling in this game. However, in spite of some of the control issues on the Double Dragon games, specifically with jumping and platforming, the actual combat in the Double Dragon series made for a really solid brawler. It handled stuff like hitting multiple targets with your attacks really well, which again is the whole idea behind the strategy of brawlers with a sort of depth of field on the arena, where you manage your position and your opponent's positioning so they come at the close-up together that you can hit several of them at once, or at the very least they're coming at you one at a time. Rare just doesn't get that. Additionally, there is some really weird hit detection with some of the enemies. As with Rare's isometric platformers, hit detection and perspective aren't handled well. It's situations where, going from perspective, they should not be hitting me, but they're hitting me nonetheless because my sprite overlaps with where their blow is being struck, or the shot is being fired, even though, perspective-wise, we don't line up. It's kind of a mess. I really wish Technos had been somewhat involved in the development of this title. It could have led to better brawling sequences, and Rare could have focused on the graphics. Now we have the final installment of the Star Fox comic. The other three members of Star Fox are chasing after Fox and Farrah in two ships. Naturally, one of them has to double up, and it ain't Falco. 
Star Fox team has a almost Ditko-esque psychedelic experience passing through the black hole before being guided through by the ghost of Fox's father who leads them to Andros' base, where they blow Andros up. The end. We get a rundown of various controllers for the Super Nintendo and their MSRP. I own a couple of the standard controllers, and I own the Super Advantage, which is the arcade stick. I like the Super Advantage a lot, though I have some issues with the cable length. At least when used with the Retron 5. I'd like to pick up the ASCII pad or the SN Pro pad, and I kind of wish someone would make aftermarket Super Nintendo mice, as I own several dungeon crawlers, like Eye of the Beholder, that use the mouse. We also have a few Japanese import controllers and accessories, like the Turbo File, which lets you port your save over to sequels and RPGs, and ASCII's one-handed controller, the Super L5. In the classified information column, we have info on the arcade mode, random weapon select, and demo mode for Gradius 3. Moving on to Game Boy titles, we have Bubble Bobble Part 2, a Game Boy version of Bubble Bobble with some notes on the general gameplay. So this is a decent port of Bubble Bobble 2, but it runs into a problem related to the Game Boy's screen. On the NES and arcade versions, each level was a single screen. All the creatures were on the same screen, and you could tell where everything was in relation to everything else, so you could plan out your movements. Consequently, this means that if you have to go through the bottom of the screen to reach areas on the top of the level, it wasn't a big deal if you knew what you were getting into. On the Game Boy, on the other hand, this means you end up making a lot of leaps of faith. Some levels are better at handling this than others by giving you intermediary platforms either within the passage or at the very top of the level that you can drop to, drop to which are out of the movement pattern of the enemies, but not all levels do this, which is incredibly frustrating and leads to a bunch of cheap hits. Next is Titus the Fox from Titus. If you couldn't tell from the title, this is their mascot platformer. Again, we have general gameplay notes. On the one hand, Titus Fox plays more or less fine, from a jumping physics standpoint, in terms of difficulty. On the other hand, this is clearly a game designed for a console or desktop computer in terms of the level design, and in particular the size of the levels, which are massive for the game pull right? and how the game scrolls. Now this makes sense, some research shows that this game began its life as a title for desktop computers, based on a song by a French comedian. Now, the platforming is the kind of physics that I expect from a desktop computer platformer. Something floaty so you can adjust your positioning with the keyboard or joystick in the jump. As far as these sort of ports go, it, it plays alright. It's nothing to write home about, but it's also not a train wreck either, which a lot of games of this style can end up being. Probably the biggest sin of the game is the fact that the game uses the same piece of music for each world. And that gets old really fast. Next is Raging Fighter. Konami's attempt at making a fighting game for the Game Boy. Well... Raging Fighter has some of the problems, most of the problems, that fighting games on 8-bit systems have. It doesn't have enough buttons, it really can't move fast enough, and it has on top of that the Game Boy specific problem where the screen isn't big enough to provide a sufficiently sized field of view for the characters. Further, the game, for some inexplicable reason, doesn't let you pause in single player. Multiplayer, I understand. Like, it's a rule at EVO, that if you pause, you are disqualified. I get that. Single player, I do not. In Counselor's Corner, we have advice for Prince of Persia for the Super Nintendo, Star Trek for the Nintendo, and a quick and dirty walkthrough for Destiny of an Emperor. In Nestor's Adventures, Nestor is playing Batman Returns, and the tip is that you should use the cape attack near a heart. Moving on to NES titles, we have Fire and Ice. This is a puzzle platformer from Tecmo in the vein of Solomon's Key. We have notes on a selection of levels. Well, it turns out Fire and Ice is in fact a sequel to Solomon's Key. The change is that instead of creating and destroying blocks of stone, like with Load Runner, 
you're creating and destroying blocks of ice, which you then must slide around the level to extinguish various flames in order to continue. Within each world, you must solve nine puzzles, which you can basically solve at your own pace, before taking on a boss puzzle, which has a more strictly enforced time limit. Where this difference comes in is that ice has, basically, cling. When a platform of ice is frozen to some stone, on the left or right side, it will remain in place, and you can only create or destroy ice that is down and to either the right or left of your character in an open space on the uh, field. So progress in the game is based around how to figuring out how to create the right sized blocks of ice to slide around or drop in order to take out a bunch of flames. It's a very fun puzzle game, and it's a really strong late-era NES game. We also have info on two hockey games for the NES. Pro Sport Hockey from Jellico, which has the NHL license, and Hit the Ice from Taito, which does not. However, Hit the Ice does have a Dragon Quest-inspired quest mode. Pro Sport Hockey attempts the balancing act of being a hockey simulation that is on the NES, and thus also has to be somewhat arcadey due to the limitations of the system's graphics and controls. It mostly works. The game plays fairly well, with some distinct hiccups in the game's controls, mostly related to switching players. There's some flicker, but I didn't notice too much. And the handling works fairly well. It does feel like switching players could have worked better being mapped to the select button, as opposed to the B button when you're on defense with B instead being an option to steal the puck in a manner other than checking your opponent. Now, Hit the Ice, as a hockey game, is a three-on-three title, two forwards and a goalie, with a smaller number of players on the field than, say, the original NES ice hockey game. The controls are okay, but what makes the game notable is the quest mode, which unfortunately has several major problems. It uses a password system instead of a save option, and random encounters are too regular. Further, because the game uses a single one-minute period per match for the random encounters, there is very little room to recover from an opposing goal or two. Next up is Nestor's Father's Day Challenge, a rundown of games you can play cooperatively or competitively with your father for Father's Day. All of these are games we have previously reviewed, Tecmo Super Bowl, NBA Basketball, Dr. Mario, Rampart, Super Off-Road, and the Chess Master. Of those, I'd probably end up playing the Chess Master with my dad, or maybe an Import Go game for the Super Famicom, since he's into that. In the Top 20 rankings, Arcade's Revenge has entered the Top 20 for the NES. A note in the also Rand and now playing is a NES licensed title based on the first Terminator movie, along with Family Dog, which is billed as being based on an episode of Amazing Stories, and the racing game Kawasaki Caribbean Challenge, among other titles. If, at the end of Year 6, the pickings for Best of the Rest are as slim as the pickings from Year 5, I'm probably going to start swipping through the Now Playing column instead. Finally, in Pack Watch, there's a Bugs Bunny title based on a variety of cartoons, Dungeon Master from JVC, and Pacific Theater of Operations from Koei, all for the Super Nintendo. My pick of this issue is Fire and Ice. This is definite proof that while the NES is on its way out, as of this issue, there is there are still some very strong titles in its lineup that are worth your time. Next issue, at long last, we have Link's Awakening, getting the place in the spotlight that it so richly deserves. See you then. for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time. <laughs>